próximo painel, ele tem como objetivo entender como as novas é, tecnologias, como é que as novas, como é que as novas economias que estão se desenvolvendo agora vão de fato se relacionar com o desenvolvimento e com o desenvolvimento sustentável. E aí, para apresentar, para mediar esse painel, eu queria chamar a Luísa, da Ellen MacArthur Foundation, e mãe do Luke, que a Ellen MacArthur, para quem não conhece, trabalha com economia colaborativa, circular. Obrigado, Lu. Olá, boa tarde. Muito feliz de estar aqui, de ver essa plateia linda. Uh, eu hoje não vou falar de economia circular, eu só vou moderar um painel que tem três pessoas muito interessantes, com perspectivas distintas, mas olhando para um futuro comum. Então, eu quero chamar aqui uh, Michel Bowens, que é fundador da P2P, um, Maria Pai Cigarran, que é CEO da Libélula, uma consultoria, e que é também diretora do Sistema B no Peru, peruana, o Michel é belga, belga. Please, yes. E Gabriel Pinto, que é gerente da Casa Firjan. Uh, mas uma coisa que era importante falar, né? o painel vai ser moderado em inglês, vai ser tudo em inglês. Então, quem precisar de tradutor, tem dois minutos para subir e pegar ali fora o, tra o tradutor. É, pode ser. Não, tá, vamos misturar. You, you, we'll mix. So, <laughs> you change with him, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. Então, o painel vai estar em inglês, se alguém quiser agora, tem dois minutos para ele pegar o tradutor, tá? Uh, queria dizer também que esse painel ele vai ser, uh, como chama, live streamed, ele vai passar ao vivo no Disruptive Innovation Festival, inovação de, uh, o Festival de Inovação Disruptiva da Ellen MacArthur Foundation, que é um festival de inovação online que está acontecendo agora. Então, quem quiser assistir esse painel depois, ele vai estar tá gravado, é só entrar em thinkdiff.co e a gente vai uh, começar esse painel agora. Primeiro, eu queria, well, welcome the three of you. Thank you for joining us in this, in this panel, in this discussion around how these new economies actually are working as vectors for new development. So this is the theme of our panel today. Um, but to start with, I would like to have like two or three minutes of you know, introduction of each of you, because I don't dare to introduce you guys. You do so many cool things that I'll let you do that. Okay. Uh, it's always difficult to talk about oneself, but... Uh um, so I'm uh, from Belgium originally, I'm uh, 60, um, which is way too old, believe me. Um, and um, I live also in Thailand where I have my family and I do a lot of traveling. So I created about 10 years ago the P2P Foundation, which is basically an observatory of what we call commons-based peer production. So the capacity of people to join together in really fairly big scalable systems like, like the open source uh, economy, open design, open source. Um, yeah, we have about 13 people in our team, so uh, we do kind of policy papers and, you know, action research. And so we want to, we want to look at what people are actually doing and uh, what works as an alternative to the current system. Hello, I'm Maria Paz Cigaran. I'm from Peru. I have one daughter. Uh, I'm this, the founder, the co-founder of a think tank and a B Corp that is called Libelula. Uh, we know that the, there are greatest challenges in, in our world, climate change, land degradation, ecosystem degradation. And we know that that's uh, actually a reflection of our internal degradation, that we don't know how to connect to ourselves, to others, to nature, and to the world we want to live in. So we work on that. We work on recruiting uh, people that want to transform the world. We call them plus ones. And we work with them to solve the, the biggest climate and uh, um, environmental uh, problems in the world. Hello, I'm Gabriel Pinto. I'm manager of Casa Finjan. I'm an economist uh, with master in finance. Um, I'm also um, I'm also a drum player in Carnival, and uh, I founded the Bloco. <laughs> well, um, I wrote the Creative Industry Map, uh, which is 
we hope to be one of the uh, one of the uh, f subsidies for policymakers in terms of creative industries in Brazil. And I work uh, with I am head of Casa Fijan, a project that that I've been managing. For, uh, I've been there uh, since the very seed moment at seven years ago. Casa Fijan is a, a center for. Um, bringing reflections and solutions for the new economy and uh, for a society that is changing very fast. Uh, we do it uh, as a think tank uh, and education, education branch and a trend lab and with innovation projects and also cultural activities. Basically we do that, uh, towers to create those responses and reflections and solutions to this new economy, which is a resume of those uh, many different approaches of new economies that we are facing off. That's it. Okay, that's great. Thank you for introducing. So I have one question to start. And if you guys have questions to the three of them or to each, to one of them, take note and we will run through, we have an open mic moment. Uh, and I'd like this to be very interactive, so take the moment to really think of what would you like to hear from these guys, okay? Um, I don't want this to be just me talking to them. Um, so just to start with, I know that a lot of us talk about new economies. To each of us, new economy can be a different thing. So I, I wanted to have like a, a ground conversation just to start with. What is the new, a new economy or new economies to each of you from your perspectives and what's the angle that you look at this? What do you consider a new economy? Okay. Well, basically, um, what I think we have to address today is what, I, what economists call externalities, right? That we have, we have an extractive economy. So I the way to get rich in this society is by extracting value from nature or from people. If you want to be generative, so if you want to improve the soil everywhere, every year, you're going to be poor. If you extract the soil and destroy it, you're going to be rich, more or less. You know, it's a bit of simplification. That's the basic idea, is that the market system does not take into account positive and negative, social and ecological uh, externalities. And this is what we have to change. We have to have a system so today is the state, you know, regulating post facto. So first you extract and then you try to repair or you pay taxes. Uh, we have to, uh, to be more uh, evolving to a system where the actors in the economy and in society know what they can do to not destroy, you know, the planet. Um, so that you remember it uh, for sure, I think. I talk about the LSD economy. It works in Portuguese, libre, uh, solidaire et durable. So you, you can translate it because I don't speak. Yeah. Um, so these three elements, very briefly. Um, sustainable, of course, means uh, uh, durable means uh, in harmony with the resources that you get from nature and the planet. Solidarity means it has to be some element of equality and social justice because unequal societies are not stable. Uh, and the libre is very important because if we don't share, uh, we cannot solve our problems quickly enough. Um, I'll just give you an example before I give the mic. In the 70s, when I was in my 20s, we had electric cars. We had renewable energy. I was working for BP at the time. I have many since. We used to buy up these companies and then we closed them. And because they were patented for 20 years, there was no movement and no progress. Think about 3D printing. Why do you know 3D printing today? Because the patents ended 10 years ago. And so everybody in the world can now work on evolving 3D printing. So that's enough for right now, but the Libra element is very important also for the circular economy. So for, for, for me, the new economy is an economy that puts life in the center of all the activities and the efforts that 
that money is in service for life and not life is in service for money. It's an economy where organizations and people work to solve uh, the social and environmental problems, where we value ecosystems and pay for them and for the services and we don't take them for granted, where uh, everything that has an impact or everybody that has an impact pays for that impact if it's negative, and where every person has a unique value and it's it's recognized and it's given a role and value in the, in the economy. So for me, that's the new economy. Well, um, I used to work um, with creative economy. Um, it was one of the pillars so, or the approaches that believe, uh, we believe that is the, the, those that form uh, the, those new economies. Or, but we work with six different um, approaches for new economies for a new economy. The first one is creative economy, which is based in uh, aggregated value in the supply chain. Uh, circular economy um, towards um, a cradle to cradle uh, economy. Um, and uh, we work with the knowledge economy, how to uh, discuss and imply different models uh, about uh, intellectual property for industries and companies. Uh, also, col uh, collaborative economy, uh, applying models of uh, collaboration uh, among companies and society to develop solutions. Sharing economy, because uh, today society, especially the young, the young ones, uh, um, have different values of uh, having or sharing that, that's totally um, uh, changing um, how you, uh, you are related to your product or solution that you develop. Uh, and multi a multi-coin co economy that we have uh, the economists, I'm an economist, uh, are facing uh, now different um, um, challenges about um, uh, policy making in terms of monetary policy. But it's just we, uh, those branches that I've talked about, we work in, new, in a new economy approach based on this, those six different branches of a new economy. Thank you. So there are overlappings between, you know, among yourselves, but there are also very particular themes that you, that you pursue in your work. Um, the next question is also general for the three of you to, to answer, and it really lies on the purpose of this panel. How did the work that you do and your angle into a new economy to building that and really in practice what you do, how did this really dialogue or transform or look at a new development path? And when I'm looking at a new development path, what I'm saying is there is a system now in place and the system has of course many angles, but there are some um, global ideas of development. Um, one argue or one question that always comes to my mind is, and when we do and we work towards a new economy, are we creating just alternatives that will be on the side or are we trying to transform the system? So my question is, how do you see your work acting in this, in this sense? Well, my position is that we, we have to look at germ forms, um, seed forms, maybe that sounds better. Um, so if you think about, let's say, the end of the Roman Empire, or rather the end of the, um, the beginning of the feudal system, or the capitalist system. Okay, I'll, I'll use that as an example. What you see is a change in accounting. So there's a Franciscan monk, he invents double entry book accounting. You have printing, the printing press. You have purgatory, which is a new idea about sin, uh, so that you can actually do business as a Christian. So all these things are seed forms that are fundamentally different from the mainstream system at that time. And in the beginning, they are separate, but slowly but surely, they find each other. And after a few hundred years, we have fully-fledged capitalism, which uses all those forms together in a coherent system. So this is the stage we are at. We cannot solve the problems within the logic of the system creating them. We are the end game of a civilizational model. And so we have to look at people uh, who are stepping out of that system and how they are doing. And then you, what you see is something very interesting. 
And so as long as you're small, you know, too small to change the whole system, what you have to do is really protect the seed forms. So basically the image I, I'd like to think about is the image of the monks in the Middle Ages, right? The monks and the nuns, to be uh, gender equal. Uh, so what they would do is they would uh, work as a community and they would create a membrane between the mainstream system and their own rules, right? The rules of St. Benedict and so this is called value sovereignty. Now we live in a market dictatorship. Only market value is recognized, extractive value. We do not recognize generative value. So as long as we're small and weak, what we have to do is create a membrane and filter the market income or the state income according to your own rules and norms. So today we have tools for this and one is contributive accounting. There are hundreds of communities. We studied 300 of them. And 76% of peer production communities were using contributive accounting. Not market, not labor time. But what is, as a community, you recognize as value for your community. And the good news is today we have technology to do this very easily and cheaply, uh, which is basically tokens. So we can actually express our own value system, which is different from the mainstream. So that's step one. And then interconnecting the alternatives. People who do organic food differently, people who do mobility differently, people who do transport differently, sustainable, sharing the knowledge, and you know, with uh, an amount of uh, solidarity in the community. I I'll, s I'll stop, I just wanna say, this is already working. Okay, I have time. This is already working. I did a study in Ghent of the urban commons in the city of Ghent, which is in the north of Belgium. We had a tenfold increase in urban commons. So in Ghent, if you want a house that's not public or private, you have a community land trust for the land. You have a housing co-op for the bricks. And you have co-housing for the services, the common services in these housing groups. You know, we have like 60 groups like that. If you want food, you have community-supported agriculture. And I think there are about 80 of them, yeah? So that's the first step as an individual is, you know, how, where, how can I make a living and have the resources I need to live with my family in ways that do not destroy the environment and that provide, you know, some kind of social, healthy social relationship. And the good news is this is happening. We are, we are going to look at this time, how badly it looks right now, I know. But you, we are going to look at this time as a time of renaissance, of actually building the transformative, prefigurative forms that we need to survive in the long run. So think about the imaginal cells in the uh, caterpillar. If you look at the mainstream cells, it's very bad for you. You're gonna die. Yeah. But if you look at the imaginal cells, right, you have the program, the DNA of the butterfly. So we, if you want to be happy today and you have to filter all the bad stuff that is happening, you have to put yourself in the position of the imaginal cell. Look at the stuff that people are doing to change. And then it's amazing how many things are happening. You just need to open your eyes to it. Beautiful. I, I love to see uh, that question with you seeing the, um, the curve of um, adopting innovations. And when we're talking about new economy, we are talking about an, a new society. And we are talking new values, new paradigms that we will be acquiring to, to live in a sustainable and inclusive world. And, and whenever something new comes, uh, to a market or to our lives, there are different types of people. Those that are the disruptors, the innovators, the ones that have the ideas, they are always in the front. And they are creating disruption. And, and they are creating this new thing that some others are looking at but not necessarily taking. Then you have the early adopter. Those, these innovators are the 2.5% in anything you do. Then you have the other 16%, 13%, uh, 
uh, that are the early adopters and they follow the, the innovators and begin to innovate and put these new values and paradigms in, in, into practice. Then you have the followers, the early followers and, and the later followers, which is the mass, the mainstream. Those that, mm, I want to see this happening, and I'm going to be testing things, but just testing, do things with, with efficiency, and that's the mainstream. And then you have the laggers that maybe they're not going to change, ever. And that's what you have. So when you, you ask that question, you, we work in every, in every one of those stages. It depends on who do you want to work with, but you have to work in all of it. You are a disruptor, Ellen MacArthur, and you work with the mainstream because you want to make them change. Sistema V, they work with the innovators, no? and they also want to go into mainstream. All of us have different ways of approaching things, but we need the whole range. What are the tools that we need to do, use or, or, or uh, follow so everybody can follow their, their, their pace? Well, that's something that we are figuring out. But the thing is that if we get to the early adopters and the innovators to the 16%, so one billion people in the world, we are creating the new world. We are creating the new economy. We already are at, at the 2.5%, so we just have to move very fast to the 16%. Well, um, you asked about transforming the system. When I, re uh, when I uh, uh, began to work in Fijian like nine years ago, um, I, I thought, well, I'm going to work in an organization that's very, very traditional, and, there's, um, and I, don't, I don't have a match with uh, those guys that were working there. But I knew that uh, Fijian had the capacity to influence and... Um, and to, and to talk and be listened to policymakers. So, I, well, there's a challenge, I'll, I'll try to do it. And, they, gave, and they, uh, they put me in a most strategic project um, that Fijian had in those five, 10 years. And I thought, well, they think I'm crazy because sometimes I think about innovation, disruptive innovation. And when you talk about innovation in those, in those type of innovations, you are maybe a crazy person when you're talking to the mainstream. But they gave me uh, the chance to do it. So um, we, um, and we, tr we do it in um, many different ways. Because we, I could be on the other side making, trying to make uh, different things a part of them. Um, for, um, maybe I could be fighting when I, I didn't believe, but we try to do something different. We try to um, first be an example to them, to the industries, uh, in terms of how to change, leading the change. Uh, we try to bring awareness about the themes that, that we believe, those themes of new economies, and we do it when we, in our exhibition in Casa Finjan, for example, we, um, there are two cases, one of Nova Tres, which is a company that produces 90% of all the, uh, the gloves you, uh, that are used for uh, hair dresses when they paint or have painters, uh, of all the, the Americas, all the Americas. They do it with, um, a product that, that's 100% sustainable, 100%. The type of, of case that um, must be told. That's why we put it, we chose to put them and bring awareness in our exhibition. Also, um, the case of another company, of companies that are changing towards a more circular economy. We do it influencing policymakers because we have a dialogue with them. So how can policies can be more uh, going towards uh, those new values that uh, the most traditional economies uh, 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 that are doing policy uh, uh, are not thinking about. Because when I study microeconomy, uh, all, the, all the theoretical part didn't uh, embrace those values. So we have to teach them how, or, or in terms of uh, legislation of institutional environment um, to do it. 
We do it in terms of education. We, uh, for example, uh, in, the, in the fashion supply chain, there is a cha there is a challenge. There is um, we don't know who produced exactly who produced your clothes. We don't know um, exactly. We don't know. We in the last years we we have uh, reading the newspapers cases of companies that were um, that were revealed uh, slave work. Well, but there's a question. They really they really knew. I don't know because I know companies that. Uh, buy products for another companies that they, they don't know don't know from who they they bought uh, from. Well, we br we we fo found um, uh, a woman from Venezuela that lives in in London, uh, which used blockchain to map the supply chain of um, uh, of the fashion industry. It was the first case and it was a very successful case. We brought her. And we gave a, a, a speech for 200 people, and, al and also uh, a workshop, more dedicated workshop for companies that wanted to be more circular. So, and those are forms. We, we, I, we don't want. We don't want to be at the other side. We want to help them, because they employ thousands, hundreds, and thousands of workers. They, we cannot. Uh, they cannot uh, be. Uh, closed down but to the, uh, from a night to the other day. Um, but they have to change. And they are changing step by step because they are facing a lot of changes step by step. But there in Casa Fijão, we're trying to uh, help them. Interesting, very different perspectives, right? So looking from really within, transforming the, you know, the, the laggers and looking at the innovators, but looking at, um, I think, a common a common vision of transitioning to a, a new, what we call the new economy. Um, I've got one question Let's, I want to start with, uh, Maria Paz. Um, you talked, well, Libella works with a lot of organizations. You talked about the different types of organizations and the, dipper, the different levels of the innovation curve that they are in. Um, what do you consider the hook for those guys when you talk to them about this new economy? What is the transition you're proposing to them, and how do you see them hooking your idea and saying, let's do it, let's go together? Well, for the, for the plus ones, those that want to take the risks and are the innovators, I, I guess most of the people that are here, we want to be there. We want to be the ones that are transforming the world, and it's a call, a mission. You know, you are here to change the world, and you are here to serve the world for that. And, and, that's, and it's very appealing, and it's hard by hard. Of course, you think, but it's really something that you connect to. It's a mission that you have. For those that are followers um, in the early stages, what they want to, to know if, if there are enough people doing things that can prove them that this work. And if you have certain elements, like cases and people that have something to show, then they will say, okay, I'm going to try this step by step, but I'm going to try. For those that are at the end, they will want to see millions and millions of people doing things so they can follow. So you just use marketing strategies, right? The way we, we communicate is, so what is, what is it important for you? You just make the profile and you just communicate. So innovator, you know, we, have a we all have a mission to save the world. We are all plus ones. We need each other. Second one, hey, this is working. It's an economy. You can have profit, and you are also having good impact. And the others, come on. You're the last one. Come on. You know, get into the boat. The profit is there, right, for the ones that are not already converted, right, which is an important thing as well. And Michelle, you talk about, um, you know, in the post-capitalism, the market will externalities will have to have a market price for that. I just wanted you to kind of talk about that and bring that idea of how do you actually uh, make these visible in the new economy? Okay, I, 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 I wouldn't exactly put it that way, you know, market price, because it, uh, supply and demand actually only gives you information about today. It doesn't factor in the future, and that's a big, big problem with market price, but that's kind of a technical detail. Um, 
So what I want and people like me, we want, what we want is how can we fund structurally generative work? Work that, is so, that improves the social and environmental conditions in the world. How can we structurally fund it? Not depend on philanthropy, on, on taxation, but really structurally. And I'm going to try to explain this in a, how potentially this could work. About two years ago, I met um, a very successful community land trust movement in France. They have 65 million euro capital, and I think they bought a few million euro of land, and so they give cheap rent to organic farmers. They have proven, scientifically, uh, through studies, that the departments, département in French, that have higher numbers of organic farmers bring down the cost of depollution, so the water agency saves millions of euros, and the healthcare improves enormously. So the, the, uh, the health expenditures of the government also go down substantially. And the thing is today there is no mechanism to recognize the positive ecological externalities of this activity, right? So that's why people who do this, they stay poor and they're pioneers have a really hard time uh, doing these things. Now, today we have a technology, and you mentioned it briefly, the blockchain. And you know, I've been very critical of the blockchain because it has uh, some ideological elements that are disturbing. Um, and the current blockchain is not environmentally. Uh, uh, right. uh, um, but I want to just to think about the distributed ledger as a concept, right? The internet is for communication. But the economy is about transactions. And now we have a potentially universal system for universal, universalizing in transactions. So here's what we do. This is, I didn't invent, this is the region network. So ecological state protocols is a protocol that we agree on that represents an improvement in the ecology, the state of the ecology, decarbonizing, better biodiversity. So we agree on an open permissionless system where everybody in the world, in a particular territory, can say, I did this. I diminished carbon through my activity. This is recognized, put on the ledger. And it's tokenized. Tokenized means that we create some currency that recognizes the activity that you did. And to be honest, that's the easy part, because that's technical. We can do this today. Then comes the difficult part, and this is where the politics come in, social power, you know, argumentation, marketing maybe, is how do we get the powers that be, big companies, big government, the water agency, to recognize that it's in their interest to create what I would call circular finance, right? Circular economy needs circular finance. So just to give you the idea, if I'm the water agency, and because of your activity, I have to spend millions of euros, euros less. It's in my interest to share 20%, 30 40% of what I'm saving to sustain you because then we create a virtuous cycle. So I think technically we can do it. It's just a matter now of actually having enough, enough social force to make this happen. But it's, it's actually technically feasible to have these kinds of systems in the whole world. And we can also do social impact protocols, you know, like gender equality. And so, we, so people who prove their impact can be funded in a structural way. Can I say one more thing? So this is one of my favorite social movements. It's a European movement uh, started in Austria. It's called the Movement for the Common Good Economy. And I think they did something brilliant. So they looked at the European constitutions. And every constitution in Europe says the economy should serve the common good. It's written there. It's already written. And so any law that has fiduciary um, responsibility to maximize profits for shareholders is actually not a constitutional law. Okay. We are free to interpret it that way, but we cannot yet change it. But what they're doing is they created the common good balance <coughs> accounting system. 17 clusters representing the common good. And 85% of the people agree with this. They say this is common good. And now they're trying it out in cities and territories. 2,000 organizations do this already. And some cities in Belgium, like Rousselare, they give subsidies 
on basis of that. This is brilliant. I tell you why. Because we don't have to kill the CAOs. We don't have to shut down the companies. We just have them to make them compete on the common good. So if you're a good CAO, that means that your entity you know, achieves very high rates of common good. Fra good. If you're a predator, you're not, gonna, you're, not very, you're not going to be very good at that. So, you know, let's, let's have another leadership that can do it better. So this, I think, is a brilliant system uh, in the, you know, for, so now they're working on the, on the technical sides. At some point, they will do constitutional campaigns. And I just want to remind you that most social advances came in the end because of legal changes. If you look at civic rights, women's rights, universal voting rights. Yeah, it's an agreement. At the end, it's a legal agreement. They were strong enough, and then once that is in place, then everything follows, right? So I think this is a good way to look at the future and to, you know, post-capitalism doesn't mean abolishing the market necessarily. It means forcing the market to embed itself in social environmental realities, right? I would argue that co-ops can do it better, but that's another discussion. Um, but the rule of the game has to change. So, yes. <laughs> Talking about companies and killing CEOs, uh, or not killing them, or making them compete for the common good, uh, I want to talk to Gabriel about what's the role of leadership and innovation and creativity? Because one thing that I was, um, I was reading about you is that you said that creative industry can be one thing, but creativity can be in any industry. What's the role of this? Well, Try to bring this in an eye. Well, I'm, uh, I could be very frustrated because <clears throat> um, I'm not the, I'm, I'm always not the yoo-hoo guy because I'm, when I'm talking to you guys, I represent the industry, uh, but which is with the image is like the polluters, the, the guys that are um, doing things bad. When I talk to, to them, I represent you. <laughs> because I'm, uh, for them, I'm the crazy one, the one who's trying to bring solutions. Well, I bet I'm okay because I believe in empathy. I try always to be in the, uh, looking at the other side. Um, because, and I know that um, now Brazil has a different, a, a, a major challenge. We have a legal and an institutional challenge to face ahead. We're, the laws maybe uh, uh, maybe going towards something that is very um, bad for for those uh, issues that that we are discussing dis uh, discussing here. Uh, we have to be very alert. But in terms of but but they those CEOs that we have a connection that we dialogue, uh, they are also um, I, c I don't know if the word is desperate, but. They are very uh, alarmed about this world that is very different the, of the world that they were competing 10 years, 20 years ago, that they, knew, they thought they knew it was uh, dominated. They're looking for us, they're asking for us for help to change their mindset and the mindset of their employees. Because the employees, the, uh, uh, the, the employees of the companies they have 25, 30, year, 30 years working for the same company. Imagine a country that, uh, that have a, uh, a huge challenge in terms of education in, uh, in the broad perspective, that the worker that is really doing the thing that you're doing uh, were born like in a different, in a different mind, mindset, with, with a lack of education in terms, and they have to change uh, these mindsets for a different world. We are doing in different, in very many different aspects. One of the, one of them is like gender equality. I'm gay, and and this was, uh, this was very important for me, because it, it, it touched like for me personally, and we uh, we. Um, Fijian designed a project uh, trying to foster the ODS and in companies, and I and I, sta I, and I said to uh, okay, but let, let look, uh, let me give me an X-ray of Fijian, and for 
well, we cannot have a different discussion for others than for ourselves. And we, we are good in our X-ray. But when we look to the companies uh, outside, for example, one of the leading mining companies in Brazil, only 15% uh, of the, the, um, the professionals were, are, are women. We are, we're doing a project to change it, to, to go towards a 50% uh, workforce uh, equilibrium. We're trying to change mindsets. The leading mindsets of the CEOs, but also the workers. Because they were born and they, they were educated in a different world, with different perspectives. It's going to take a time. I know we have, we have to rush. But we're trying to do it. But the mindset and talking and having an empathy uh, um, form of embracing it, I think it's the only way we can do it. Otherwise, we're going to have models from outside coming to our country and maybe companies that are, are big companies from outside dom dominating the employees that are now here. We have to do it from the inside, trying to connect, trying to go to the minds and the hearts uh, I think that's the only way we can do a different, do different for our state and for our country. Maria Paz, would you like to co comment on that? <laughs> I know you would. <laughs> you would be great now on the connection side. On the connection. Yeah. No, I think no. The, what you were saying is, I mean, we we will not change anything unless the other person wants to change, right? And and I think. Uh, there's these four connections that we, in this, in this path that we are towards a sustainable, generative world that we have to work on. The first one, if, if you transform yourself, then the whole reality transforms. So, so you have to work with yourself and transform yourself. When you do that, then you are able to connect to others because you, are more in, in, you have more empathy. And we have, when you have more empathy, you understand the other point of view and you're able to connect. And there's where you go to the second level. You connect to the other human being. And there, the magic uh, becomes to, to happen. The, this mindset and heart uh, changes, right? The other one is, is the connection to nature. We think that nature is there for granted. Nature gives us life, but it's not for granted. If we connect to nature, since we are very little, then we will love nature. And w things that we love, then we take care. If we don't know nature, if we are not there, we will not take care of nature. And that's why surfing is so important. Surfing and all the sports in nature are so important. And, and, and the other thing is, is the connection with the world we want to see. We have to dare to dream the world we want to live in. If we don't picture that, it's very difficult that we get there. So we need to, to work on those four connections in any movement that we are working on. Yeah, I, I want to say a little thing about uh, related to these um, uh, concerns and, and issues. So we have two central notions in our work in the P2P Foundation. One is peer-to-peer which is the ability to connect with people uh, freely and permissionlessly and do things together. And the other one is the commons. And the commons is a shared resource that's governed, that is, um, so there is an object, something we do together to make it or maintain it or produce it. There's something that we do together, so that's the commoning, doing it together. And then there is rules and norms that our own community creates while we're doing this. And why is this so important? We are entering an age of material scarcity. Yeah? We are going to have peak resources in copper, in cobalt. So people, if they believe they live in a scarce world, can become very mean to each other. Right? So you retreat to your community and you, st you start being angry at all the people you perceive are competing for what you need. This is very dangerous. This is what's happening right now, actually, uh, in this very country, I think. There's another approach, which is if we use the commons. I'll give you one very practical example why this is so important. So in Ghent, there is a car sharing co-op, not Uber, non-profit, 
association or a co-op that shares 130 cars, 1,300 people. Full mobility, 100%. If you need a car, you have one. It's calculated to be like that. Every shared car replaces 9 to 13 private cars. Think about that. 80% less steel, copper. So, and it's 80% cheaper than buying your car. So, from a very pragmatical point of view, you know, you can start thinking of your fellows as, you know, we're all in this together, we share mobility, and therefore you don't have to be anxious about the resource. And I live, my wife is Thai, and she lives in that world, so I'm still pretty anxious about life and, you know, my income, and, but uh, she reacts differently because she has a family uh, network. And she knows whenever something goes wrong, some, someone will come along and help. And I took my mother, who had Alzheimer, for four years in Thailand. In Belgium, it's a nightmare. I would have to work very hard, put my mother in an institution, visit her two, three times a week, you know, with a face like this, because I have other things to do. And there, every afternoon, somebody came to walk with my mother. I, had, I didn't have to ask anything. So these kind of dynamics, you know, you have less, but you actually can do so much more with that less, right? This is why the commons as a notion is so important. And so we argue for a common centric society, right? Where the market and the state serve the, the citizens who are involved in commoning and managing and creating shared resources. And this is going to be vital, not only socially, but environmentally. This, thank you. This is really interesting to hear, especially coming, well, it's amazing that you are an European living in Thailand, because I think the sense of abundance can be even greater when there's lack of resources. And we see that here, if you go to a favela, an informal settlement, you see a lot of abundance generated there. But I'm gonna pause now, because I really want to go to the audience and see, Michael, do you have the mic? Where is Michael? Is there, are there questions in the audience? Do we have questions? Yes, from Chico. <laughs> You need a mic. We can share. Of course. Abundance of mics. Hi, guys. Thank you for this amazing panel. Uh, my question is about how do we get people who are comfortable to actually move where they have to move? So um, I think about especially people who are um, free riders, right? And people who are actually capturing a lot of benefits from the extractive economy in general. Like all the big polluters who are making a lot of money and stuff, they have a vested interest in not to move and not let other people move. So they will be active blockers of any kind of movement that will eventually threaten or even change the system itself. How do you deal with those entities and people and powers that be? Is this question addressed to someone specifically? Um, no, but I'm really curious about Michael's view on it. Okay, who raised the hands to answer? Okay. Yes, um, this is a very good question. Um, so first of all, you know, in the online world, this is a bit different because we have actually anti-rival resources. This means that the more you share, the more people use it, the better. So there's no really that big of a problem for free riders. In the material world, when you do physical production, and I'm working on this, we call it cosmolocal production. Everything that's light is shared globally, and everything that's heavy is done locally. And so I, talk, I work a lot with co-ops and the solidarity economy, and they have a big fear because, you know, in, in terms of uh, property, uh, you have copyleft and copyright, yeah? Copyright means it's mine, and if you want to use it, you've got to pay me. Then you have copyleft, which is the opposite. Everybody can share. But this is, a, a, this is not a problem in software, because you know, if you're a person and you have a head and a computer, you can do it. So the investment is very low. Once you move to physical production, you need people, you need buildings, you need raw material. Then people are sensitive to the fact that here we are making a design together and then this big company comes and takes it out. So we propose something called copy fair. 
And Copy Fair says, the knowledge is free. But if you want to make money with our work, you have to be in reciprocity. And it can be as simple as being becoming a member of an association, you know, to pay certain costs of the, of the cooperative infrastructure. But this is very important because otherwise what we get is the communism of capital, you know, which the open source economy today, you know, is essentially used by big private companies. Um, okay, you know, it's, it is what it is. But we cannot move to physical production, and if people are fearful of being, you know, of this kind of predation, so you have to create this membrane and negotiate between the commons and the market. Yeah, and I think we need to go back to moral economies, ethical economies, where these things are embedded in the market function itself. You know, which is still very useful for many things, but. Um, so, yeah, we always have to take into account uh, this dynamic. I think every, every person, we, we tend to general, gener, generalize. generalize, yeah, generalize, and, and we think that person is bad or good, but we have bad in, and good in everything we do. And every person has something that moves him or her. And I think that's the first thing that we have to try to do, know what is that that moves that person. The second thing is the messenger. Maybe you are not the messenger. Maybe the messenger is a wife or a peer or a child. You don't know what, who. The, the person that is, is, is respected by this, this person and can, can be heard. And, and if someone doesn't want to change, give them time. They will. Maybe at, at the end, but don't waste time there because your energy is very important. It's very important how you save your energy and put your energy there where the change is going to be. And then leave things for others that have other kind of energy that maybe can deal with it. I would just add one thing. Um, yeah, you said something that maybe is not you. You have to ha have to talk. But now with um, uh, uh, the power of network brought by the social networks, you can be, if you gather your, your, the, the people that ha have the same voice, be sure that they will listen. And um, but before that, I, I think this empathy, uh, this uh, approach is very needed because. Otherwise, we're going to emphasize and continue in a, pl in a bipolar system and way that we are now. We are like in a, the country is divided in basically in two countries. Uh, and also, the policy making is going to be divided in two different types of legislation. And if we, not, uh, if we don't connect to the other side um, in terms of dis uh, discussing, because uh, it was re re reflected in this election. We're going to go to a, a, a way that's totally different that of the way, the path that we believe. So um, that's the thing. I think empathy and, uh, and using the, the channel and the power of social network to, to uh, bring your voice, to be listened, I, I, think, I think that's the way. Thank you. Are there more questions from the audience? I see one hand. Michael. Hello, guys. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to explore more of this subject you just uh, started to, to, uh, to talk now. And it's a big question divided into connected parts. The first one is how you guys see the challenge for Brazilian businesses and civil society in boosting this new model of economy and therefore a new model or new society pretty much, including these uh, regenerative uh, ecosystems and more socially sound can models. You, can you speak a little bit louder, please? Yes, can you repeat yeah. the first question? How okay. you guys see Brazil what? I didn't okay, get so it. Uh, how you guys see the challenge for Brazilian businesses and civil society considering these conservative uh, elections we just uh, had now, so this is a conservative victories in this year's elections, 
And then the second part is, uh, during these conservative times we are living, how to foster better collaboration in between businesses and civil societies uh, so we the people can organize resistance and opposition and make sure our voices and beliefs won't be silenced. Thank you. Who is <laughs> Hashtag ele <não. laughs> I, I precisava dizer. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm just a moderator here. I do have my view on that, but, or, or questions maybe on that for being Brazilian. But I think, Gabriel, you are the best position here, but of course, open to comments from the foreign ones. We'd love to see the foreign. Yeah, the, um, it's a good question because when I, well, those uh, elections made us think a lot, made me think a lot. Where, wa where was I? Where, um, well, but I, in, in, in a response to that, there is a person sitting in this audience, Liana, are you there? Liana Brasil is there. She's organizing, uh, she's in the black part. I don't know if she's, uh, she's organizing, for example, she's organizing a movement that how, ca how come um, they used uh, artificial intelligence to, imp uh, to multiply um, their vision and to connect to people? Aren't we those who speak about innovation? I wouldn't, wouldn't be us le leading into uh, artificial intelligence to connect and to make our vision more, more powerful. Well, where, was we, where, where we were? And now Liliana is leading a movement um, that, uh, that is uh, trying to uh, um, use artificial uh, 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 intelligence to make those ideas that we believe um, to, con to be listened to more people. Because if we continue to speak to uh, us or to each other, maybe we, don't have the, we are not powerful enough. If, if we don't go to uh, the eastern part of Paraná, where the, the housewife lives and she's fearing that she's going to lose her work and she doesn't want to know about the Amazon forest and for, the, for her the problem is about the work of her husband and the, maybe if we, do, we cannot connect those people there uh, we've, we've can, we have a, a discuss that uh, listen to other their problems and talk their languages we will not be able to do it we will be uh, less and less and less because they they are prepared they are ready they are there especially in Rio we have a big challenge ahead there are, things can come at the other side but we have to be clever we don't have, we the, the resistance you, you thought about resistance the really resistance is to be clever more than ever to talk the language that, that they, they want to speak, to connect it to the heart. Otherwise, we're going to be less and not be listened and use uh, tools that are there to, to make those connections. I guess I just received a note that we've, yeah, we are pretty much finished with our time. I was hoping to have five more minutes for Michelle to comment on that. But of course, I know that there will be a lot of discussions around those two days about how do we deal with these new ideas that we bring and then Colabor America is, is a very fruitful ground for that in such a conservative times in Brazil. I know that there will be a lot of room for discussions for this, but I actually need to unfortunately finish this panel. Thank you. Three of you are, were amazing panelists. Thank you everyone. Thank you for the audience for being so present here as well. And thanks everyone for being listening online as well.